Good morning. Am I audible? Good morning. Am I audible now? Good. A very good morning and a warm welcome. Uh, we are going to do today some basic something very some very very basic understanding on philosophy. So uh, this will be relevant uh, for your PhD it directly in very few ways maybe, but in life at least it will be very important. So the main topic that is going to be addressed is ethics, which we are going to do the next day, tomorrow. But to understand ethics, we need to understand what philosophy is. And for that, uh, today we are going to have a general concept of philosophy about philosophy. So uh, some of the students, a uh, very few I think, are from philosophy department here, who already have a basic idea, much more than basic idea of philosophy. But for the rest, uh, I have tried to make the PPT and today's lecture in a way that it will be relevant for everybody, not just the philosophy students. So we'll have a very basic idea of philosophy today. And tomorrow we are going to continue with ethics, which is a branch of philosophy, right? So uh, the first question, like it was said uh, in the syllabus that we are addressing, what is philosophy? Right? So the very first question that we are going to address is what is philosophy? And it is very difficult to it is very difficult to answer it in one line that what is philosophy? Because philosophy is extremely vast. Uh, just please give us a moment to fix this. Like philosophy is extremely vast and it's a huge discipline. You cannot possibly define it in one line. It is called the mother of all disciplines, even the mother of knowledge, because all disciplines, all subjects began from philosophy. The starting point was philosophy. Initially, what was there in the name of knowledge was philosophy. Then with time, different disciplines started coming out of the mother subject philosophy. That is why it is called the mother subject. Now it has been said that man cannot help but philosophize. Have you ever asked yourself these questions like, who am I? Am I just this body or something more than that? Does God actually exist? Is the world real? Have you ever found yourself asking these questions? See, I can see a lot of people nodding their heads. So you see, human beings cannot help philosophizing. So if you have tried to answer these questions, these have been your attempt to philosophize. But that is not philosophy exactly. But these have been your attempts to philosophize. So philosophy comes very naturally to us. Now, when we are trying to answer these questions in a very systematic, rational way, in a logical way, then we are actually philosophizing, right? And we are trying to make us form a systematic worldview from these questions. That is what we are trying to do in philosophy, okay? So philosophy attempts to answer these very basic and fundamental questions. These questions are very basic to us and very fundamental questions. But these are not simple questions. These questions are in fact very, very difficult. 
to answer they can be confusing they can the answers can overlap with one another they can contradict one another and there can be very many problems in answering so philosophy the kind of question philosophy refers to answers tries to answer they they are very basic fundamental questions but they are not simple they are also very difficult questions to answer the next thing we must remember is very often we confuse philosophy with mythology and superstitions but that is not at all the case in fact it is philosophy is an attempt to steer clear of all superstitions through rational thinking and logical thinking now this rational thinking logical thinking is not only important for your everyday life but it is it is going to be very important for your thesis and phd work if it is not rational if it is not logical then it does not come out in a proper way so one misconception about philosophy that is often held is that philosophy is very similar to mythology but that is not so so <coughs> A, an attempt to define philosophy is that philosophy is a rational attempt to formulate understand and answer fundamental questions about life truth knowledge right and wrong etc this questions about right and wrong will be dealt with in ethics tomorrow and we have to remember that it is not just to answer these questions even to formulate the questions like you formulate your uh, thesis the problem like you for, uh, formulate a problem first before proceeding with your uh, thesis so this <coughs> philosophy is also about formulating the questions first understanding unless and until you have a clear understanding you cannot proceed to answer <coughs> so what the question actually means where we have to place the questions and then by understanding the meaning of the question then we can proceed to answer and what kind of questions like i have already said very fundamental questions questions very fundamental to life and uh, what uh, what is it about it is about life it is about knowledge it is about what actually exists it is about truth it is about right and wrong so what exactly do the philosophers do what is their task like i said that philosophy was an amalgamation of all the disciplines from where the disciplines started coming out one by one be it the science subjects the art subject the humanities everything was in philosophy so now that the subjects have come out the subjects have been separated from the mother subject what remains is there any need to do philosophy separately now philosophy like socrates said socrates said something very important about philosophy is that philosophy teaches us not what to think but rather how to think the way we should systemize our thought it will not tell you that this is the correct answer this is the question and this is the correct answer to the question like if you ask does god exist yes he exists full stop no that is not going to happen so it is going to teach you how to think about the question what is the right way of thinking about it so that you do not end up in contradictions and your thinking pattern is consistent and what are the abilities that a philosopher has a philosopher can analyze a philosopher is able to question orthodoxies and expression is very important expression has to be clear and lucid otherwise interpretation will be varied and also no it is 
it is in the right place what do philosophers do na oh online mode it's not moving no sir Uh, can you check which slide you're on uh, in the online mode? Now it's okay. Let's see if it's changing. Is it changing? Okay. So the main ability of a philosopher is the ability to formulate question and to follow them up with logical arguments. in many disciplines we try to answer these questions through experiments and we get proper answers to it we do not have such scope of experiments in philosophy it is theoretical so all we have is the tool the instrument of logic by which we can make or we can uh, construct powerful arguments which will give us answers to our questions right has it changed all right after the definition now coming to the etymological meaning of philosophy etymology is the origin of the word etymological meaning of philosophy is that the term philosophy has been derived from the greek word philosophia philosophia which can be broken down into philo and sophia philo means love and sophia means wisdom so the etymological meaning of philosophy is love for wisdom if it is love for wisdom then what exactly is wisdom is it just storing the knowledge storing all the data around us and whoever is able to store more is wiser than the other definitely not right for your phd for your work you definitely have to store a lot of information i agree but that will not necessarily make you wise what you also have to do along with that in order to be wise is that connection between the data to be able to make valid inferences not just any inference valid and relevant inferences from whatever you have from your data being able to make valid and relevant inferences from the data understanding the connections between the data right and obviously applying them in relevant places and judiciously the application is also important and again anybody who is able to do these things can we call them wise if it is not directed or channeled in a proper direction for example an armed robber who knows a lot who has all the information in his mind uh, about robbery he has studied a lot lot of previous robberies and he has gained a lot of information he has connected the data and has made very good inferences very logical ones can we still call him wise and he is about to apply it sorry i missed the most important point and he is about to apply it so can we still call him wise i don't think so we cannot call him wise in the sense we are talking about because it is not channeled in the proper direction so it has to be channeled in the proper direction for the good of the society only then we can call a person wise or we can call it wisdom right so if there is any problem any doubt please feel free to ask and interact 
Okay, so what is the value of philosophy? Philosophy can provide answers to some very important questions. Like I've already said that one field where philosophy has been very successful is science. It has been able to give very direct answers to questions. But it is not always like that. Sometimes it is not able to provide one clear answer to the question. But in those cases, with the instrument of logic, it is able to say that which answer is more probable or more logical or better than the others. Okay, if there is, we, if we do not have one clear and precise answer to the question, then obviously we have many possibilities many speculations. And then how can we say that one speculation or one answer is better than the others? We have the instrument of logic for that. In those cases, we're able to say which answer is more probable or uh, more logical than the others. And just the act of doing philosophy can still be helpful for you. Why? Because it improves your critical thinking skills we will come to that, what critical thinking skill is. It opens your mind, like Burton Russell said, that it is like a liberating doubt. We will again come to this, that what opening your mind is. And it forces you to be precise, clear, and rigorous, which will be again very important for your PhD thesis. Now, doing philosophy roughly consists of two parts. First is, which is the same as, like I might not be saying this at every level, but you will be able to find a connection between your doing PhD or writing a thesis and doing philosophy because after all, it is doctorate of philosophy. So there is a direct connection between what we do in philosophy from the beginning to what you are doing in your own subjects right now. So what we are trying to do here and what you are also trying to do in PhD is that first is the generation of possible ideas and concepts and answers to that with the respect to some questions or issue. So first thing, thing is to identify the issue. So here also in philosophy, we do the same thing. The first thing is to identify an issue or a problem or a question. And then come up with the generation of possible ideas or possible answers to that question, to that problem. And second is the evaluation of those generated beliefs or answers. About which answer, if we can say one is true, one is false, if we cannot, then one is more probable, other is less probable, one is good, one is bad. And all this we do with the help of logic. And finally, on the basis of this, we find answers we can accept and those we can reject. So like I have said already, philosophy is very theoretical. It does not have you to do, it does not require you to do anything in practical or uh, experimental. We of course have thought experiments, but I'm not going to go into that, which has got nothing to do with like actually doing a practical experiments. So what is it to be done in theory in philosophy? The first thing is the thesis that is to be proved like we said, the generation of possible answers or beliefs to certain problem or issue. The same thing that is done in the same steps that are followed in PhD, in your thesis. The first thing is the thesis to be proved. Second, we find if we have relevant answers for it, then why do we believe in those answers? What are the reasons? So the logical arguments to support my answer. Once I've identified the problem and I have found a, an answer for it, 
then i need arguments why i believe or why that answer should be believed in why that should be believed in so i need logical arguments in favor what i also need is what can be the possible criticisms of these arguments right the proper way of proceeding is that we also need what can be the proper criticisms of my arguments it is not like that that i have given the arguments so i will not criticize it i will only highlight the good part of it then it is not going to be a strong thesis or a strong uh, argument so i also need to find the loopholes and what the uh, the oppositions what the others might uh, critically think about it so i need criticisms for my own arguments and finally if i want to establish my arguments against those criticisms i also have to answer why those criticisms are wrong or what can be the possible answers to those criticisms so which is again the way we proceed in thesis is that first there has to be the problem the possible answers to the solution Uh, the possible answers or the solution to the problem then the arguments why i believe that a certain answer is true the possible criticisms of the arguments and the possible answers to those criticisms so example a uh, example giving an example of a theory in philosophy right now is i do not have so much time you can definitely contact me afterwards i will give try to give it to you okay i will definitely come back to you you can contact me after this okay right now if i go into that it's going to take a very long time now for the evaluation of the theories the evaluation of the arguments that have been provided we have to remember for a theory to be successful it has to be consistent and it has to be correct consistent meaning there cannot be any contradiction in it it cannot explain the same event in two different ways which are contradictory so there cannot be any contradiction and second is in the sense it has to be correct it means that it cannot directly refute what is available in ordinary experience now i said i'll come back to the questions of that philosophy makes you open minded and it teaches you critical thinking okay become about being open minded sometimes people think that what i believe if i believe in something that is different from everybody else then i am extremely open minded if my belief is something very different but that is not the concept of being open minded open minded is when you when when you it is about your attitude towards your, the belief you are able to consider alternate beliefs if there are beliefs different from your own you are able to consider that there are alternate beliefs you are not biased towards one belief and you accept the possibility that the belief might be wrong and this is called being critical towards the belief so if there is a belief that exists that is different from yours belief a and belief b i say that god exists you say that god does not exist so i do not have any initial preference that because i'm saying god exists so i will be more biased towards my belief i am able to keep both the beliefs in the same state and there is no initial preference no initial bias and i am able to consider the fact that any one of it can be wrong 
And I have also said that philosophy teaches you critical thinking. Again, by critical thinking, it is often believed that I have to criticize whatever you say. The moment you say it, it, I have to be cynical towards it, I have to be dismissive, and I have to be critical towards it, then it is critical thinking. It is not that. Critical thinking is also something very much related to the concept of being open-minded, where you do not automatically reject a belief just because it is not your belief or you do not believe in it. You cannot reject it just like that. If you reject it, there has to be logical and proper reasons for rejecting it. Okay? So that is critical thinking. And critical thinking also makes you open-minded. So the two, the two uh, things that we just learned about being open-minded and critical thinking, they're very much related to one another. Now coming to the branches of philosophy. These are the traditional divisions. The branches of the traditionally we have divided philosophy into metaphysics, epistemology, logic, ethics, and aesthetics. We will do each branch separately. Metaphysics will ask fundamental questions of reality. What actually exists? The term metaphysics, meta means beyond. And physics, we all know what physics is. So we here in metaphysics, what is being done is we are trying to answer questions which are beyond physics, which have not been already answered in physics. What physics gives us or tries to give us are direct answers. And where it stops, metaphysics begins there, where we do not have any direct answers to the questions. All we have are speculations. <clears throat> uh, the kinds of questions that are uh, answered here are what kinds of things exist like only particular things or general things exist? And how is existence possible? What are ideas? If we cannot see them, if they do not have shape and size, then where do we place them? Is there anything that exists over and above our body like some spirit or soul? <laughs> what is space? What is time? Second is epistemology. Epistemology answers questions about nature, scope, and limits of human knowledge. What is knowledge? How is knowledge possible? What are the sources of knowledge? A very interesting epistemological problem of Russell was the five minutes world hypothesis. He said that if there is a speculation, if I tell you right now that the world was created just five minutes ago, with everything that we see right now, it was everything was created just five minutes ago, including your memories and all history books and every record we have of the past, everything was created just five minutes ago by an omnipotent God, all-powerful God. If God is all-powerful, then he can do it. So now can you disprove it? However much we might think that this is improbable, definitely we all have a feeling right now that it is very much improbable. But if it was, can you disprove it? Can it be disproved? Yeah, how can you? Because I have said that everything, including science, wherever we have, whatever is in your memory, whatever has been there in the history books, in the science books, everything was created like it is now, just five minutes ago, by God. Then go ahead, disprove it. Uh, 
improbable Right, that it is almost to the extent of not possible. But how will you prove that? Is there anybody trying to say yes? Existence of what? Yeah. No, if we accept that there is a God who is all powerful and omnipotent, He has brought this into creation just five minutes ago. No, for the last five minutes, no. You definitely existed for the last five minutes, but before that, yes. Yeah. Evolution. Yeah. trying to say maybe that just like we are saying that we uh, cannot disprove this at the same time we cannot prove this either right that is what you're yeah exactly so what she's trying to say is like we cannot disprove this we cannot prove this either right so that is not being denied he's not saying that this is true and evolution and everything is wrong that is not being said what is being said is that there is no certainty. There is no absolute certainty in any kind of proposition like this. So here, what is there is that this might be absurd. This sounds very absurd to whatever we know, to uh, the theories of evolution and everything we have learned, this sounds very absurd. But however absurd it is, we cannot logically disprove it. That is the point. So uncertainty exists. And this kind of uncertainty is very uh, special for philosophy. This is what makes philosophy special. Unless there is uncertainty, obviously then you do not have anything to do in your PhD. You do not have anything to prove. So that definitely is uncertainty. Even if we find that there is no uncertainty, we make it a point to still find something, some kind of gap from there so that we can uh, make up our thesis and uh, answer the uh, problem, thesis related problems. So this is the main, uh, I deviated maybe slightly from epistemology and uh, just to the, just to make, uh, come, uh, just to come out with the uncertainty of knowledge and how a speculation which sounds so absurd can still not be disproved completely. The other branches are aesthetics, which deals with arts and beauty, the philosophy of arts and beauty, feelings, judgments, and standards of beauty. Like, is art an intellectual or representational activity? If I am evaluating an art, then if, if somebody has seen this glass of water, and has represented it on a sheet of paper. So what do I see that how well it has been represented or has there been any kind of intellectual contribution into it? How well the actual reality has been represented or whether there has been any kind of creativity, his own representation. 
not exactly variation among different point of views that would make everything subjective i'm not going into subjectivity and objectivity at the moment what i'm saying is suppose there's an artist who is trying to draw this glass of water and i am trying to evaluate the work of art then what do i see that how well this has been represented if this is slightly bent then whether it is also there in the picture or do i see where his own creativity is whether he has contributed something from his own intellect that makes the two very different if i can make it clear like is it clear or is there any more questions about now ethics ethics is most important for us and we will continue with ethics the next day yeah. ethics is the systematic st uh, study of values and morality it is the question of what is right what is wrong and why they are right why they are wrong what kind of things are good and desirable if we judge actions then which kind of actions can we call good or right these kinds of things are dealt with in ethics you are also going to do obviously publication ethics and research ethics which will be directly relevant for you but a basic understanding of ethics is required in order to go to that level so ethics will not only help you in your phd work it will also shape the kind of person you are it will help you ask questions about which actions i am doing and whether those are right or wrong and how i can judge them and now logic i've been talking about logic from the very beginning for the instrument i called logic the instrument for making powerful or arguments see if you are having an argument argument is not a heated i'm not talking about a heated discussion that goes into a fight or a quarrel that i'm not talking about that i am talking about when you are having there is a topic and you are having a discussion about what can be an answer to that question in a peace and calm and quiet environment where you do not get up and punch the other person so in that kind of environment if you are discussing and you are presenting what seems to be quite logical to you and the other person is advancing only very irrelevant and illogical arguments which does not make any sense then what do you do would you feel like continuing the discussion either you say that okay whatever you saying is fine i am wrong you are right or you stop the discussion completely and walk out that is the power of logic unless and until there is logic in what you say there will not be any discussion there will not be any scope for any discussion unless there is logic in what you write in your thesis it is not going to make any sense and reasoning in logic can be deductive or inductive deductive logic is when you necessarily get an answer from the premises and inductive logic will give you only a probable answer from a uh, very many of particular instances are you asking any right and now i'll come to any questions if you have any questions i can see some raise their hands some of the participants raise their hands yeah yeah sure uh, deductive who wants to know about deductive and inductive reasoning i did not go uh, very uh, into details about it in deductive reasoning you can see that you start from a general case and then you come down to particular instances from a general case you apply it to particular instances where the premises are given 
and the conclusion is absolutely necessary and in inductive you are taking specific examples like you see the first crow crow it is black you see the second crow it is black you see 10 crows that are black you see the 100th crow that is black and after seeing the nth crow you conclude that all crows are black so you take particular instances and then you generalize it so this is this is the basic uh, difference and these are the two ways of reasoning because uh, for deductive logic deductive inferences you get absolute necessity whatever conclusion you get it follows from the premises with absolute necessity if p implies q uh, if you have p implies q and you have p then most definitely you also have q you cannot but have q it follows with absolute necessity but in most cases we do not in real life in most cases we do not have such certainty we do not get such necessity so for that reason we also have inductive reasoning which do not give us which does not give us absolute necessity but only probability it it is possible that there is one crow somewhere in the world which is white which i haven't seen so it is only probability it is not absolutely necessary that all crows are black the validity if you are talking about validity of the argument both the types of reasoning are going to the ultimately proceeding towards the validity of the argument it is deductive logic that will give you absolute validity or invalidity whereas inductive logic will only give you the probability it is probably valid or probably invalid sure mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but uh, like uh, if we talk about topics and cases mm -hmm. they had uh, they gave different case in one particular topic mm -hmm. like art like like art they have given uh, a theory about art 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 mm -hmm. different way mm -hmm. so how can we like think about that theory is right and that this this theory is right and how for that exactly which theory is right and which theory is wrong is very difficult to determine it is very difficult to determine one theory as right and the other theory as wrong so what we have is one theory is more probable and the other theory is less probable so again for that we have logic and also there can there are arguments which are which have to be logical and for through which there are different philosophers which have followed plato socrates plato like socrates we know only through plato so plato aristotle every one they have been interpreted by various other philosophers in various ways so there can also be interpretation of the same argument in various ways so there are many things that have to be kept in mind in philosophy we cannot usually do that that one uh, theory is absolutely wrong and the other theory is absolutely true it is very difficult Anybody in the sense? Anybody in the sense like uh, the person who is in this field, like, mm -hmm. philosophy and like some some. Yes, I can have my own theory. I definitely can my have my own theory, but it depends that who is ready to accept my theory. How many people are ready to accept my theory? How logical my theory is? No, no. Theory is not a proven fact. We have done what is theory previously in philosophy. A theory is not a proven fact at all. A, a theory is still open for criticisms. Um, yeah. a theory in philosophy a theory is still open for criticisms and it is in the, in philosophy there are no proven facts if it is proven fact then you have come out of philosophy and you have entered the realm of science good i am enjoying the discussions
Please carry on. Okay, there were some, uh, some people have their hands up. I don't know how to un Okay, they can unmute. Uh, participants, <laughs> online participants, you can unmute and uh, ask questions. I can see your hands are up. Subha Shorkar and Papu Maji. You want to ask anything? <coughs> online participants, Subha Shorkar, can you please switch on your video? All online participants, please switch on your video. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, their hands up at time. Hello. Yeah. Uh, when starting in science, in going mm -hmm. into the or bachelor's uh, level in study in master of philosophy, but when you study in this place, in this sector, you will get a thing with master of doctorate in philosophy. So, why? I didn't understand your question. Like, we also have yeah. BA and MA in philosophy. Then why is it doctorate of philosophy? Because every subject after a certain level is philosophy. What you're doing is ultimately you're philosophizing. I said in this life that what philosophizing means. Right? I have spoken about what is philosophizing. So that is exactly what you're doing right now in your own subjects. That is why you're studying philosophy here today. because it is relevant to what you're doing, whatever subject you belong to. It has come out of philosophy and ultimately after a certain level, it merges with philosophy. Like if you see, uh, there is no Nobel Prize in philosophy, but whoever has most of the people who have been nominated for uh, Nobel Prize, like be it Amartya Sen or anybody, their work is always related to philosophy. So that is how everything starts from philosophy and ultimately merges in philosophy. Uh, yes. <coughs> Who am I talking to? Online? Participants? <laughs> Chandan Shaw? You can unmute yourself. Ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. ma'am, actually, I'm from agriculture. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, actually, for example, in agriculture, we used to make some hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Sure. First, we used to make some hypothesis. After that, we used to proceed for that, for pick that hypothesis, or just uh, whether it is away from that, what the hypothesis we use. Mm -hmm. This is one thing. And second thing, if you see, ma'am, the interpretation really varies from one person to one person. It is obvious. Mm -hmm. Then how we can connect this with our philosophy? The hypothesis you're talking about is what I have also mentioned here as the thesis or the problem of the uh, thesis. The problem that is identified and the possible answer. First, you have to have a possible answer, which is your hypothesis. Then you can prove it in some other way and philosophy provides arguments to prove it. There are no experiments or there are uh, nothing, there is nothing practical to be done in philosophy. All we have are arguments and um, the logic decides the power of the arguments. What uh, the hypothesis, what we are framing probably belongs to philosophy. That we can have some critical thinking. <laughs> Uh, no, when you're trying to answer the hypothesis, that is where critical thinking is involved. 
So unless okay, but, but with respect to interpretations, ma'am. With respect to interpretations. Interpretation. Because yeah. Because for example, interpretation of one thing. Yes, there can be various interpretations. Yes, yes ma'am. That how either uh, that how can be justified? Yeah, there can be various interpretations. It can differ from person to person, and this is called this phenomena is called that's when a uh, when something is subjective. Subjective means it differs from subject to subject or from person to person. So there will be certain things that are subjective, whereas there are certain things that will be accepted. In general, not it might not be accepted by all, but it is accepted in general, and. at least in philosophy it is always open to criticism so any kind of argument whatever however powerful it is it is still not 100% guaranteed it is always open to criticism anything else thank you thank you सो गाना सो द लेफ्ट ऑफ द मेन मेन वे यू शुड गेट द बट